Right, good morning, everyone. Morning. Sorry, uh, is anyone in the room? <laughs> um, I'll say again, good morning. Good morning. So, good, good, that's better. And welcome to everyone online as well. I think we have probably almost 30 people, at least online. So, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. Fantastic to see you. Um, so, for those who don't know me, my name's Phil Beals. I've been medical advisor to BBS UK for... 28 years now, and this is my 28th conference. I did miss one in 2000, because we were in the States finding the first gene associated with BBS. Um, so I think we've been excused for that one. But um, I think most of us here um, probably haven't been around for that quite that long, but I can see some old timers, so that's great. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm talking to you specifically, <laughs> Gary. So. What it is, is that I would really like to also thank all the supporters, the professional supporters, be they medical or scientific, who uh, always, uh, as uh, Laura has said, come and give up your time um, and support. We, we have no problem getting people come and supporting us in this, uh, in this endeavor and to share all the medical advances and scientific advances. So I'd like all the, the professionals, scientific, medical, just to stand up for a second very quickly, any time today. <laughs> Good. So, this, thanks, we can all sit down again now. Just so that you know who to make a beeline for, instead of just me. <laughs> Great, okay. And we'll be in the workshops later on and, and so forth, so it'll be very helpful. Um, also, welcome to all the new uh, families and, and uh, folks who are here today. Could you just put your hand up if, you're, if this is the first time you've been at this conference? Wow. I'm counting probably about at least a dozen, if not more. Yeah, that's great. Okay, without further ado, um, we'll kick off on um, some of the updates. And so, in a slight departure from what we normally do, um, I'm going to share the first uh, presentation on the scientific medical update uh, with Helen. Um, Helen doesn't need any um, uh, introduction, but I'll introduce her in just a moment. Um, but I'm going to begin by saying that thanks for coming all the way from Germany. Um, and uh, you can tell us how long you've been here as well, uh, coming to this. And um, I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you. Hi, you everybody. Oh, perfect. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. perfect. So my name's Helen, um, also referred to as Phil's underling. Um, I started, I came to my first conference, it was actually 19 years ago because it was 20 years ago in September that I started. So right now is my 20 years anniversary of working on BBS. I started as a PhD student and now I'm a professor in Germany at the university and I've got a research team working on BBS. So Phil asked me if we could just say a few words to start off to talk when we're talking about the research, just so everybody in the room knows a little bit of what's going on and what, what the science is behind BBS, kind of as a platform and a springboard before Phil talks um, more about what, what he's actually doing on the science side. So, as most people in this room know, our bodies are built up of cells. So we've got lots of different cells in our body. We've got skin cells and bone cells. Um, and they all can look slightly different, but they, a lot of the cells then work together to create organs, which is how we think and breathe and talk. And some of these cells have a small little hair sticking out. And it kind of, some people call it an eyelash-like protrusion. So it's basically like a little, a little kind of worm sticking out of the cell. And that is called a cilium. It's called a, um, sometimes called a primary cilium. I've actually got a picture here blown up of what this actually looks like. So if you can look at the surface of the cell in the gray, the things sticking out in the middle. Some people say it looks a bit like a, birth, a candle on a one-year-old's birthday cake. Um, some people say it's a little worm coming out of the hole. But that is basically this cilium that's on the surface of virtually all cells. So most cells in the body have a cilium and a structure like this. And they can look very different. So, for example, in your nose, if you look at them from the top, it can look like a big plate of spaghetti. Or 
in the brain, they also all line up and they move fluid around. And in the ear, they all look a little bit different. And you've also got these structures in the cells in your eye. So they can all look slightly different from the outside, but inside they're actually pretty much the same. And like I mentioned, there's two different flavours of these. There's cilia that move things around, so those are the ones that you can find in your brain and in your lungs. But then there's also cells that often only have one of these. And these are the ones that are so special in um, the BBS community because these are the ones that sometimes don't function quite as well as they should be. So you might be asking, what are these cilia doing? So the cilia, and this is really the research that's taken you know, many, many years to, to, to unravel exactly what these cilia are doing, they're actually a little bit like signal antennas. So we used to say they're like radio antennas, you know, receiving um, signals. Nowadays, I kind of say it's more like a Wi-Fi antenna. So it's actually receiving information. We now know that actually the cilia is also sending out information. Um, and that information is really important for the cells to talk to each other. So it's just like us. We all need to talk to each other in some way. The cells in your body need to talk to each other so that the cells are working properly, so that the tissues and the organs are working properly. And that only works if these cilia are functioning. So it's, it's, it's a way for the cells to communicate to each other. And when that's not working properly, then obviously if there's bad communication, we all know when people aren't getting on with each other or can't understand each other, it can make it really, really difficult to work. So the primary cilia are really, really important for cells to work together to communicate. And you might be asking, well, what's that got to do with BBS? So I'm sure most of you have come across the term of, as a gene. So genes are small segments of DNA that your cell then uses to make a protein. And the protein is actually kind of the building blocks of everything in your body. So when there's a, a change in a BBS gene, then a BBS protein um, does, might not fold exactly the right way. It might be slightly changed, which means that um, the function of the cilia is not absolutely perfect. So it just means that sometimes there's some, some that the traffic and the information that the, the signals that have to be sent by these cilia, they're not always getting there as quickly um, as they need to be. And that's what the BBS proteins, they're really, really important to get information into the cilia and out of the cilia again. Um, and so when there's a mutation in a BBS genes, it can mean that it can sometimes take a little bit longer for that signal to arrive or not. And that is the most important thing that you, people need to know when they've got BBS is that the problem is because of the cilia and the cilia um, are, they're found all over the body, but there's some tissues and some organs that uh, have more important cilia. For example, in fact, you can tell me more about which organs and which tissues involve cilia because it's you guys that live this every day. So I'm sure you know that there's, this, there's special cilia in the eyes, in the kidneys, um, and also sometimes on your skin. Some people, whatever symptoms you're having, it's because the, the cilia in those tissues aren't working optimally. And what we also know now is that it's completely different for everybody. Everyone has a very, very, very different experience because there's so many other factors going on. And that was the beginning. We're now going over to Phil again. I told you it'd be a circus act. Right. So um, just to want to say a couple of things about some of the work we've been doing very recently um, around the numbers. So we know that BBS is found worldwide. Virtually every country we look at, there are patients with, uh, there are people with BBS. And the problem is it, it varies from country to country. And does it vary because of the fact that there are actually more people or because of the healthcare system in that particular country doesn't happen to capture 
uh, or provide the services that, that we're blessed with. Um, and I think that is partly a mix of that, um, because, for example, if we look at some of the old literature, Switzerland, about 1 in 165,000 of the population uh, are thought to have BBS. Whereas we go to the Faroe Islands, not too far off uh, the northern coast of Scotland, um, and about 1 in 4,000 people will have it there. Um, and there are various reasons for that we don't need to go into today. So um, I, with some colleagues from the Netherlands a few months ago, decided we, we've got to really work out what are these figures really looking like. And because there are these large data sets now, and one in particular called the UK Biobank, where there are half a million healthy volunteers in there between the age of 40 and 69, about 15 years ago they joined that particular program and they've captured all sorts of information about them. You know, do they smoke, all their activity, what do they eat every day? But they've also done their genetics as well. So we have around um, 400,000 uh, genetic sequences to look at. So we went in there and had a look at that and we found that one in 135 people are actually carrying uh, genetic change associated with BBS. So in other words, they're carriers. They don't have BBS per se, because you, as you all know, they have to have, you have to have two variants, two mutations, um, but they're carrying one. But we can do calculations to work out what that should mean. So it means we have to revise our figures. So in this country, we were looking at, you know, between a few years ago, between one in 100,000, one in 120,000. Now it's about one in 70,000. Um, and we have in the clinics, or, and, and BBS UK, probably around 700 patients that attended at some point or other. So that means we're missing about 300. And this might ha help to explain why we're getting a, a real huge influx of new cases that are being referred to the clinic now. I think just in the last 12 months, we've had uh, about 30 patients uh, referred in London alone. So I think what we're starting to see is that these patients were probably um, had a different diagnosis, uh, usually at the eye, hos eye hospitals like Moorfields and various other eye hospitals, um, under the badge of retinitis pigmentosa or what have you. And now that genetic testing has come on board, they're being <coughs> redefined, if you like. So there's a lot more out of you out there, is what I'm saying, than we originally uh, appreciated, um, which is good because then it, it matters when it comes to. Um, thinking about, uh, you know, not only causes, but also thinking about treating this. So for those of you who um, are new and don't know, um, I did describe last year and probably the year before that the work that uh, my colleague uh, Victor Hernandez and I have been um, working on for the last 12 years in my lab at UCL is to develop a, a gene therapy for BBS, and we'll come on to why we've, we've done that in just a moment. But we had a lull time um, for, for various reasons, economic reasons mainly, um, in the last year. But I'm pleased to say that we're back. We had a press release a couple of days ago signifying the fact that we now have a new investor on board, um, uh, which is basically helping us to now move the program forward. And I'll show you uh, um, where we are on that progress line in, in just a moment. So thankfully we're back up and running now and um, the lab in London is uh, starting to develop the uh, gene therapy and um, hopefully we'll get that into the clinic um, either at the end of next year or the year after that. So what is gene therapy? Well, it's in essence, it's, um, uh, it's a method of uh, restoring or people talk about replacing, it's not really replacing, but it's restoring the function of a faulty gene as Helen described. Uh, in a particular cell. But what we have to be able to do is to get that particular new gene back into the cell, and you have to do it in, in a directed fashion. And there are a number of ways of doing this. Um, we can either do it directly into the body, or in the case of some diseases, you can take the cells out of the body and then do it in a dish and then put the cells back. And that's good for sort of blood diseases and immune diseases. But for something like BBS, you can't do that. So we have to deliver it directly uh, into, the, into the organ uh, that matters. And so in our case, it's, it's, it's the first uh, uh, program is actually into the eye. And we'll talk about that in just a second. 
But I think I mentioned last year that the first successes in gene therapy were back in 1990, and it was developed, as I just mentioned, for immune deficiency. Um, but really, I think one of the really striking areas that has really only just been come about in the last uh, uh, three or four years, really, is in the transformative nature, which really shows the possibilities of uh, gene therapy going forward and how it can make just an amazing difference. And so the example I want to give you here is a disease called spinal muscular atrophy. Um, and I'm going to show you a video in just a second, but it's a really devastating inherited condition where babies die very early. Um, so let's hope this video works. Spinal muscular atrophy, or SMA type 1, is the leading genetic cause of death for infants today. A devastating fact this family knows all too well. Our first daughter, she was diagnosed with SMA type 1 at 6 months of age, and she passed away at 15 months old. This is a disease that is devastating for infants. A large percentage of patients die before one year of age, but 95 plus percent are gone, unfortunately, by age two. SMA rapidly robs babies of their ability to move, talk, swallow, and eventually breathe. When Milan and his wife Elena found out they were pregnant with their second child, Evelyn, they prayed for a healthy baby. Unfortunately, that was not the case. When she was born and the results came back um, and uh, found out she was positive for SMA type 1. And we both kind of just broke down. We found out about the clinical trial here at Nationwide Children's Hospital. This is really the first time that we've been able to apply gene therapy to any neuromuscular disease. Today was a very special day for Evelyn. She was given genetic therapy for her missing SMN gene. Babies with SMA are missing a gene vital for development. Through a one-time injection, gene therapy replaces this missing gene. For Evelyn, this gene therapy worked. We start seeing changes as early as two months after treatment. She started to push and she started to get get more, more active, holding her head up. And uh, a little after th three, four months, she rolled over on her own. Now three-year-old Evelyn challenges Dr. Mendel to a dance-off at her annual follow-up appointment. She comes back after three years, and she runs up to me and hugs me and says, Dr. Mendel, I love you. I forget that she has SMA. This is a healthy girl, and she does everything that a normal three-year-old uh, child would do. Something like that has never been achieved before. With our first daughter, it was just devastating to lose a child. You lose all dreams you had for their future, and now we can actually save for college. So, so I think You'll all agree that that not only is a powerful message, but it's also a powerful treatment for a devastating condition. It's quite different from BBS, of course, but there are hundreds, if not thousands, of conditions out there that could benefit from gene therapy. So we're not going to get into the details of why that might in itself be, uh, be difficult for a lot of conditions, but just to focus more on what we're trying to do. So we're focused, because we have to start somewhere, on... Uh, replacing or rather augmenting the BBS1 gene that is faulty because that is the gene that is usually uh, or, or rather most frequently uh, faulty um, uh, more or less across the world. Um, may not be true in Asian countries. I think um, we've seen in China that maybe BBS7 is the most common one, for example, but this is the one we're focusing on for the time being. And the way in which we're delivering, as I said earlier on, you have to deliver it as close as you possibly can to the tissue that's damaged, um, is essentially to inject the product, as we call it, the vector, into the back 
of the eye close to the photoreceptors, as close as you can get to the photoreceptors. These are the light sensitive cells in the back of our eye that collect the light. Um, remember the rods and the cones. And the work that has been done uh, both in, in our lab initially at UCL and now, and now at Exovia that uh, Victor's been leading on has really shown, led, us that, led us to the conclusion that in the mouse models that we have, which, or, which lose their vision very early on, that we can prevent them deteriorating any further. So in other words, that vision for those, those mice um, are retained more or less for the lifetime of those mice. Um, that's the bottom line. But how do we get there? We have to actually make this vector, which is actually a virus. So we use a virus that is uh, around us in the environment. It's called an adeno-associated virus, an AAV. And it is very good. It has one purpose, and that is to inject um, or rather transmit DNA into cells. It's absolutely, it's super efficient at doing that. So what we can do is we can utilize those particular uh, viruses. They, they don't cause us any harm in, uh, whatsoever. And we can use it to actually uh, insert the, the missing gene or the faulty gene, if you like, into the target tissue, into the, in this case, into the back of the eye. But one of the big challenges we face and, and lots of other uh, people who are doing gene therapy is actually manufacturing. It's a very complex process. It's incredibly expensive. Um, and you need these big vats. I mean, this is more or less like a brewery, to be honest. It's the same type of vats that, that uh, uh, you might to grow yeast in to, um, to make beer. But in this case, you're actually uh, using cells. You have cells in there uh, which are manufacturing and spitting out the virus. But inside the virus, is the BBS1 gene. And um, so that's, that's our, our challenge. Once we've made that, we then have to get it into the cell. And so um, that in itself is, uh, is Mother Nature's way of doing it, is, is using this particular virus. And we've made a little um, cartoon, if you like, which shows exactly what's happening. I'll describe that for those of you who, who, who obviously can't, can't see it. But the virus, comes up, bumps up against the cell. In this case, it's going to be a photoreceptor cell in the back of the eye and other cells. And it fuses with the membrane, the outer membrane of that cell. And we'll see that happening now. And then it gets taken up into the cell, into what's called the cytoplasm. It still has this covering of the membrane around it. And then it moves towards the nucleus. Remember, the nucleus is where all the information is kept in our cells, and then it opens up and delivers the naked DNA. So this is the BBS1 gene I'm showing you here. And it sits there. It sits next to our DNA in the cell in which this has been inserted, and it will operate. And it should operate there, producing the missing protein, in this case BBS1, um, for decades, we would hope. We don't know how long it'll last, but we're hoping and we're expecting that it will last for decades. In other words, preventing deterioration of visual loss um, for that particular period of time. Could be 10, could be 50 years, who knows? We'll, we'll wait and see. Um, but obviously we can't, as I've said before, we can't restore vision. We can only uh, arrest or halt the progression of the disease. So obviously, as you know, it's important how early we give it. And we can talk about that some other time. So, um, oh, lost this one. So, one of the, you know, how, how do we actually know that this gene therapy is going to work? And so the work that uh, you guys have helped us with really, because all of you who come to clinic, um, and anyone actually who now goes to the optician, will have had this particular test called an OCT, or an optical coherence tomography, but OCT is quicker, right? And you just put your head against it, look into, the, uh, look into the eyepiece, and it takes a picture of the back of the eye, the retina. I'm sure many of you have had that. And then the software converts, it turns it on its side, if you like, and we can measure the thickness of the retina. So much so that we can do it in such detail that we can actually tell the various layers 
And one of the layers called the outer nuclear layer, which is a th the thick, darker layer on this slide, is um, oh, just, the, the, just, just this part here that I'm, I'm, I'm showing for those who can see. Uh, that contains the photoreceptors we've been talking about. And this thins out as one gets older, who has, whoever has BBS. Um, but the beauty is that we can now use this, and we've shown this both in, in patients, but also in, in mice as well, that this is a really good readout for us when it comes to determining whether or not the gene therapy is going to work. We're going to do other tests as well, but this is a primary um, outcome, if you like, a primary endpoint that we will be, be utilizing. So I'm going to jump really just to the end of this, my piece here really, and just say where are we in, in, in the progress to getting this, uh, this work done. This work goes back to, you know, uh, way back to 2003 more or less when we, well 2000 when we discovered the first gene, but also <clears throat> working out what do those genes do, what do those proteins do, making the mouse model, um, we have, we've, we've done that, and then characterizing the mouse model, showing that it, it's very similar in, in many respects to um, you know, the problems that patients have, uh, early onset visual loss, weight gain, all those other sorts of things as well. And, um, and then what we've been doing is, is doing a lot of testing uh, at what we call the preclinical level to make sure that everything is working and it's as safe as possible. Um, and what goes hand in hand with this, as you see along the bottom of this slide, is the various funding opportunities we've had. Um, and I can now say that just of the other, well, beginning of June actually, we've now been supported by um, a company, a London-based company called Alsa Ventures, um, who are helping us to fund this program, such that we, we can now probably say with a degree of, um, well, there's no certainty, but clarity, that we should be able to start recruiting toward the end of next year to test this particular product in patients themselves. So um, there's a lot of work yet to do on that, and that'll be the clinical trials, and we can talk about that in, in, in the clinic this afternoon. So I'm going to leave it there just to share, share with you where we've been and where we're going. Um, I'm going to hand back to Helen now to um, talk a little bit more about the uh, science updates. Okay, so I'm back again. Um, obviously, what Phil is doing in this company is absolutely phenomenal and fantastic. And it really would only have come about for many, many decades of work in the lab by the researchers. Um, so, and I just wanted you guys to know what else is out there, what else is happening right now in the landscape of BBS research. So what, if for those that can see where I'm showing you here, is it looks like it's a chart with lots and lots of lines going back from 1946 to 2023 to right now. And basically, that hopefully you can see that there's only a few little bars at the bottom and it's getting more and more and more as we get closer to the day. So what we're seeing here is the entries in PubMed. Now, PubMed is basically a massive database, it's kind of a massive digital library, and every time someone does some research, some biomedical research, that um, it, gets, it gets archived there. Um, so it's basically just a collection of all the different research happening in biomedicine. And when you put in the term bardet beetle syndrome, this is the chart that you get. So it shows you all the different um, papers and articles and research studies that have involved bardet beetle syndrome. Um, and last year was the highest number. So last year there were over 104 entries. And I can tell you now that we already for this year have over 70. I think it's about 75. It goes up almost every two or three days. Um, so just to say that there's a lot, a lot of research out there. There's a lot of labs. There was a massive jump about 15 years ago, 20 to 15 years ago, and now it really is gaining steam. And I'm expecting this chart to, to actually continue going up at a, at a much faster rate because so many people are interested in studying BBS um, and the related uh, symptoms. And so when you look at all of these different um, articles in there, there, there tend to be three groups 
of science that's being done. Three groups of um, uh, papers and, and, and studies that are being looked at. So the first group is lots of papers are out there looking and trying to understand exactly what these BBS proteins are doing. So I mentioned first that the BBS proteins are important for um, the cilia to work. Well, specifically, these BBS proteins are important for sending signals into and out of that cilium. So you can kind of imagine it's a little bit like the train conductor that will let the, the train of um, signals going into the cilium and out of the cilium. Um, I'm only going to read one title, but for example, ARL3 mediates BB zone ciliary turnover by promoting its outward movement across the transition zone. That obviously sounds really complicated and, and difficult, um, but it's just an example that they're really looking at how these BBS proteins are going in and out. So that's one group uh, of, the, of the type of research where they're really looking at the nitty gritty and finding exactly how these little um, proteins are working together to, to send the signals. The other group, there's also lots of um, research on new mutations that people are finding all across the globe. I think it was fascinating seeing from Phil's slide how many more new cases we're finding with lots of different mutations and that it's a lot more common than we initially thought. So that's another category and along with that there's also many articles showing new descriptions of the disease. And this is really, really, really important because really understanding the disease and understanding what you patients experience on a daily life, that helps scientists understand what is actually happening on a, on a cellular level and on a molecular level within that cell. And without that knowledge, we can't go on to develop other therapies. So go, you know, if it wasn't for finding out exactly what BBS1 was doing or BBS10 or the, each individual BBS proteins, we're not then able to, to figure out what we can do to, to support the cells where that's not working as well anymore. Um, so on this slide, there was a couple, I just, in this category, category two as I'm calling it, there was some um, new studies talking about dental anomalies in BBS patients, that their, their oral health um, is, is sometimes affected too. There's also a story about hyperphagia, which I know we're going to talk and, and hear more about later, but also sleep, that many of the BBS patients uh, have problems with their sleep. Um, and I think it's great to see that, you know, many, many more um, disciplines are starting to realise that, that BBS can, can involve so much more than just the eyes and just the kidneys. The third group of research projects um, and research stories that is coming out there is something that I find is really exciting because it's all exciting, I know, but this is something that I kind of had this feeling, this inkling that it's not just the cilium. So we know that the BBS proteins are most well known for trafficking signals into the cilia so that the cells can communicate better. But we now know that there's actually other structures in the cell where the cilia BBS proteins might also be supporting. And one of that is the mitochondria. So the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell, for those of you who might remember from biology. So the mitochondria help make energy. And without mitochondria, your cells don't have any energy. Um, and so there's been some reports to say that actually some of the um, BBS Proteins can actually support and help with making energy um, with the mitochondria. Um, and we've also found that some of the BBS proteins can actually go into the nucleus. So the nucleus, as Phil was saying, is kind of the brain and the organizing center of the cell. And all the genes um, are not found in the nucleus. And so when the virus, for the gene therapy, the virus has to go into the nucleus. Um, so that the, the cell knows what to do with that message and that information. So the nucleus, like I say, is either the brain of the cell or the computer of the cell. Um, and it's a real surprise, actually, to find that some of our BBS proteins aren't just in the cilium, they're also in the nucleus. And I can tell you a little bit anecdotally, we saw this in the lab many years ago, but everyone thought, oh, that can't be real, that can't be true, um, it must be some kind of technical artefact. 
But it's great to see that now people are really are starting to take notice and it has actually been verified now um, in many, many different labs all across the world. And this is actually happening, that these BBS proteins are actually going into the nucleus, which is something that we really need to figure out what they're doing there. Um, and that's, that's, that's not just... For, we, we really think that these proteins might have a bigger role in, in, in other parts of the, the cell as well, not just the cilium. But of course, the cilium is the most important because that's the one that helps the cells communicate. So those are kind of the, th the three categories. So first of all, the nitty-gritty, what are the proteins doing? Then how are these affecting patients um, and the symptoms? Um, and the third one is, is what are other BBS proteins doing elsewhere? But I really want to highlight that the research on ciliopathies and on BBS, there's been such an explosion of this in recent years, largely in, in, thanks to you guys. And I really, really mean this. It's because the patient community is so willing to, to help and to be part of all these studies. We really, really couldn't do that without you guys. And we really wouldn't be where we are as a scientific field if it wasn't for the patient involvement. And for you guys, it might seem really obvious and normal, but that's not the case in all different fields. You really come across other fields where it's not as communicative. And I really you know, want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you for always trusting us being there, being willing to participate, because without, without that, we wouldn't be where we are um, in terms of what we know about, um, about cilia, about BBS. Um, and it really is a special community. Even I know you all feel it here amongst the patient community, but even amongst the scientific community, we've really, really built up a strong network internationally over the last few years. Um, and, the, you know, the research is really accelerating. And I was really pleased, and I just wanted to say this, because in Germany, we've been working very hard the last year to get a consortium going, to have four or five different labs working on one particular topic. It's called ciliary dynamics. It's basically how, where you see cilia, where they, how they come, how they go. But the point is that it's five groups in Germany all working together because as you know as a team you can get so much more done than just as an individual and yesterday evening we just found out that it got funded so it's a big deal for the cilia landscape and cilia research landscape in Germany um, and also that will reach out to all the other different um, teams across Europe and across the world so without you guys we couldn't do any of this and so, of course, I'm sure you know what my next slide is going to be. We need your health again. <laughs> so, in the lab, we were looking at the cilia in your nose. And we realized that even though most patients don't really talk about it, we noticed that the cilia in your nose actually do look a bit different and seem to behave a little bit differently in the test tube. So what we can actually do, and I've had this done, I'm so proud, because Phil did it to me when I was a student. So he stuck a brush up my nose, um, and we um, grew the cells in a little dish for a couple of days. It's actually published my nose cell. I'm so proud of it. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it's, you know, it's that the, I think my most, most famous picture is the picture of my, cell, my nose cell in a, in a paper. Um, but we'd, we've done this from um, patients and, and, and healthy individuals. We grow these little nose cells in a dish, um, and you can kind of watch how they're moving, and you can watch what they're doing. And for a long time, people thought, oh, you know, the, the BBS isn't involved with that. But if you look more closely with all the new technology that's been developed, we do actually see changes. And I was thinking... If we see changes on a dish, there must be something in the community that we can find out. There m maybe there is some, something going on. In, it's called sinonasal. So we're talking about the sinuses and the nose. And there's a very, very simple questionnaire that we can do. It's only about 15 questions, and it's you know, a score from one to five about how often you, know, you have a runny nose or you know, do, you, do you get a stuffy head or um, you know, do you ha have problems falling asleep at night. So there's some very simple questions, it's, um, and it would be great if anybody would like to um, uh, fill this out for us. I'm going to be in the... I don't have a special room. I'm just going to be in the lobby all day with my questionnaire. 
feel free to come over. I've got two wonderful assistants with me today. So I want to th point out that these are two very, very talented students, very completely motivated and dedicated to BBS research. They didn't stand up because they didn't know if they belonged, which where they belonged to. Um, but like I say, I'm super proud of them um, because they really, they didn't have to keep going. They did their masters with me in, in, in BBS and both of them were like, no, we want to stay with BBS. And so they really, really stuck with it. Amelia went to Cologne to work in kidney. Vanessa is the one that's working on what BBS is doing in the nucleus because she thought it's so exciting that like we've got to keep going with this. Um, they're here today and they will also help with this questionnaire. So come and find us. We're going to be out in the lobby. Um, it shouldn't take long. Obviously, only if you're interested. No one has to, to, to you know, we absolutely don't want to force anyone to take part. I'm hoping we'll get something out of it. And I'm hoping that maybe in the next few years I can then come back and tell you what happened. But I'd be really interested just to find out what's, what, what your experiences are. The other thing, we're actually doing this with the German patients as well, and we can compare the German patients and the English patients and maybe even the Dutch patients. <laughs> so, um, and the other thing about this questionnaire, we actually we have to do it, apparently you're meant to do it twice a year, once in this, you know, to, to see the different time of year. Obviously, some people might have allergies. So I might be back again. And so if we have the conference in April next time, it's a different time of year. <laughs> but anyway, with that, that's the last thing I wanted to say. I'll hand back to Phil. Thank you again from the bottom of my heart and hopefully see you later.